Lakeland PBS presents Common Ground, brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Production funding of Common Ground is made possible in part by First National Bank Bemidji, continuing their second century of service to the community, member FDIC. Welcome to Common Ground. I'm producer director Scott Knudsen. In this two segment episode, producer director Randy Cadwell takes us to Lef Schwartz's Sugar Shack, where biology students learn how to make maple syrup. Then, in a bonus segment, visit Prairie Chicken Booming Grounds. Good morning, Dana. <laughs> All right, good morning, biology. Welcome to the Sugar Shack. These are our hosts for the day. This is the host that I've shared with you about. This is Les Schwartz. So this is his property and his Sugar Shack uh, and his team of helpers. So we're gonna have a, a little introduction from, from Les and gonna go through a few things, see what you know. So today we had um, a Henning 10th graders biology class with instructor Dana Dam and they bring the kids out and they uh, help me tap trees. Well I've been teaching for about 15 years in Henning and uh, I've known Les for uh, quite a few years, a good friend of our family. And so when I found out that he does the maple syrup program, I thought it was a great way to connect what we're learning in our classroom give the kids a hands-on approach to it out here in the woods. Do you know what kind of maple trees there are in Minnesota? There's three different kinds of maple trees and then there's another tree that we don't think of as being a maple tree that is in the maple family. So there's four different in that family. Anybody know what they are? Name one of them. Somebody else. Huh? Well, the, the, the obvious one is the sugar maple because they call it sugaring. And so that's where we get maple syrup from. The sap comes from the, the sugar maple. And it's also but it's a good chance for them to get out and actually get hands on and uh, identify maple trees and help us tap a lot of trees. We'll have Dana give you up into groups in just a little bit. So let's go to the other side and I'll show you how to tap some trees. So this is a sugar maple and you can see by the, the black bark on it and if you look close at the tree you'll find spots that the tree has been tapped. This one's been tapped I think um, going on, I think this is the 15th year that I've tapped these two trees and sometimes these really produce. But if you look close at it you'll see spots where the bark has a round hole in the bark and you'll see that there's, um, it's all healed shut and that's where a tap was one time. And so when you're out tapping trees, you're going to want to look at that because you're going to want to stay away from where there's an old one. So when we tap trees, we try to stay kind of between no higher than our high eyes and no lower than our knees. So we try to stay within that part of the tree. Well, the old days, they used to use a hand brace and drill them by hand. Well, of course, you know, we're going to use a battery operated drill to do that. And so my taps require a 7 16 drill bit. So we're going to tap, we're going to drill into the tree. We're going to stay as much level as we can. Um, if you do angle it, it may be angle up just a little bit. So when you go into the tree, you're going up, but not very much. Try to keep it fairly level. And then the drill bit has a piece of tape on it. That's how far you drill into the tree. And it's typically about an inch and a half or thereabouts as how far you drill into the tree. So I'm just going to drill in, kind of go straight in, and just push on it and just start it slow. And 
And so what I'm going to do is I want to clean the hole out really good so there's no pieces of sawdust in there because the sawdust will plug the, the tap up and the sap won't come out. So we take that and then we're going to take <clears throat> a tap and we're going to use we're going to use one of these and we'll put it in and you got to make sure the, the the cut part here is up and the drip at the end is down. So you put it in and try not to hit anything else with the with the point of it and then you're just going to tap it in. And once it's tapped in, we're going to hang a bucket on it. So it's just a, this is a four gallon or a four and a quarter gallon bucket. There's a hole in it. So everybody can see that hole. There's a hole. And, and then some of the buckets have handles and some don't. Put the handle on the opposite side of the hole. And then we're going to hang, hang it on the tree. So, and then there's a lid that goes on. And the lid just has little edges on it to clip on the rim of the, the bucket. And it's actually easier to do that with the bucket off. And you kind of have to squeeze the bucket and it squeezes a little bit hard, but squeeze the bucket and it'll just snap on. So when you're going out there, you'll have one person drilling the hole, one putting tap in. And then you can either look through here or you can look on this side and hang it on the bucket and make sure the bucket hooks onto that hook on top. And you can go to the next tree. You know, the tree needs to be about 18 inches in diameter. That's a pretty good sized tree. I don't have too many of those on this property. So we're going to go one tap per tree. You have questions? We ready to give you up in groups, Dana? Yeah. Let's group, yes. Uh, remember what you just learned, and then we're all going to be in the same area, so you guys can trade back and forth, all right? got to keep this level. Yes. <laughs> you know, like that, and aim for the center of the tree. Go in to up to the tree. And in a short amount of time, like in an hour, hour and a half, we can tap 150 to 180 trees, which goes a lot faster than if two or three of us go out and tap trees. Our state curriculum covers, you know, tree identification, tree process, photosynthesis, and a lot of those other processes that these trees are doing. And so we learn about it in the book and in the classroom, and so we can come see it out here in nature in real life. They got a system now, huh? They always enjoy it. They look forward to it. They've been coming out. I think this is their 10th year that they've come out. When they get back, you know, they'll talk about it. And the next year's group gets all excited before, long before they even come out. Because, you know, it's, that's a big thing over in the school over in Henning to come out to the Sugar Shack and help tap trees. and. In a short period of time, it's turned into about the most popular thing in my classroom. You know, over the years, when I see alumni, they always ask me if I'm maple syruping and if the trees are running. You know, nobody ever asks me about, uh, you know, chemistry or physics or anything. They, they always want to know about maple syrup. My job was I put the lids on the bucket and put them on top of the taps, and then I started drilling. In my classroom, it's not always about lecture and books. It's about being a Minnesotan getting outdoors, learning about some of the things that our state has to offer. And I think tapping maple trees is, you know, just as Minnesotan as ice fishing and deer season. It seems like there's less and less farmers out there, and there are, and there's, so there's less kids that are, know where their food comes from. And I think it's important that, that kids know where some of their food comes from. Whether it's from a, a dairy farm or a, a crop farm or a vegetable farm or any of the other stuff. It's, you know, anything you buy at the grocery store, it comes from some type of farmer. And a lot of them don't know where it comes from. It's like, well, their food comes from the grocery store. It's like, well, someone's got to produce it, you know. They, they can't believe something so good comes naturally from the trees.
I enjoy seeing the look on their face and you know those types of things because they're they're not familiar with that type of stuff. It's good for them to see, you know, fresh, natural stuff. Rory must have been just a slave driving you guys, huh? <laughs> Holy smokes. How much do you guys do? Uh, 30. Go off. Mm. Here. I, I've been maple syruping about 15 years. My wife and I were visiting a friend and it happened to be in the spring of the year. There was a, a brother and sister and they were making maple syrup. It's like, oh, that's kind of interesting, you know. So I went over to their place and they were uh, finish cooking it in the garage on a turkey cooker and then uh, finishing it putting it in jars in the house and So I just started inquiring about uh, What has to be done how to do that and it's like well, I know I have maple trees on my property I could do the same thing. So the first year I only tapped nine trees and uh, and I hauled the, the sap from uh, this location over to their place and cooked it over there and then the following year, I tapped 29 trees, and then it just exploded from there. I'm jumping in with both feet, and so I started tapping. The, the following year, it was like 129, and then it went to like uh, 300 taps. And the last few years, it's been right around 400 trees I've been tapping. I built the sugar shack, started it in the fall of 2010. Well, pretty much finished it the spring of 2011. That was the first year that we cooked out here. I started cooking, making maple syrup at another place, and it's like, well, I need to build myself a sugar shack. And so I did some research on it and kind of looked at different designs. Part of the reason for the sugar shack is in the spring of the year, you can have snow and rain and sleet and that kind of stuff. And it's nice to be able to cook so you're away from the elements. And then, and then the other thing is, you want to be able to take the smoke from the wood fire and get it away from the pans. And so with having a sugar shack, you have a smokestack, uh, a chimney, that the smoke can get up and away from your syrup so you don't get some of that smoke infused into your maple syrup. The sap is in the tank outside up on a stand and it comes in on this hose here and then I can regulate how much is in my pan through a valve here. This valve feeds a, a preheater and the preheater Basically, the cold sap goes in the bottom and the warm sap comes out the top and then goes into my cooker. And my cooker is set up so it's, it's flat and there's compartments, but the compartments are connected at, in, in the dividers, there's holes in the opposite ends. So the sap comes in here, it has to travel all the way down here before it can get through this divider to get into this next one. And same with over this one and back over there. Kind of cheat and use a big match. The front pan's a finishing pan, and the back pan's the evaporator pan. By now, it's starting to turn to syrup, but it's not there yet. And then in the final one, I have a thermometer um, 
that is for maple syrup and when it gets to seven degrees above the boiling point of water, that's when I start drawing it off. And I take a little bit off at a time. So I'm always putting sap in and I take the syrup off when the temperature is correct. And I probably take off about a quart, maybe a little more at a time. And then I wait for the temperature to come back up. And we just keep putting wood in it, keeping it hot, keeping it boiling. For maple at 2% sap, it takes 43 gallons of sap to get a gallon of syrup. And for birch, it's about 75 to one up to 100 to one. So you gotta boil pretty much all day to get a gallon or so of birch syrup. One of the things we do when you cook maple syrup is you have a lot of evaporation, a lot of moisture that you have to get rid of. So I de designed mine so I can open the windows up above and let all that moisture out. Ready for a draw? Yeah. All right, here we go. And when I draw it off, I also run it through a, a filter, and it's gotta be hot in order for it to go through the filter. And then I put it in a, a milker pail. After it's in a, a milk pail for a couple of days, I put it on a uh, cooker over here, and I put it in, in kettles on my stove over here, and I bring it up to a boil, and then I check it with a hydrometer. It's a, a syrup hydrometer, and it's kind of like a sap one, except it's for syrup. And I'll take some of the, the hot syrup, put it into a, a measuring cup, uh, a hydrometer cup and put this in there and where it floats it tells me where it's at as far as sugar content and so on this one here it needs to be at 32 degrees which will give me 66 percent sugar and if it's if it floats higher than that I have too much sugar if it floats lower than that I don't have enough sugar so we usually draw it off at about seven or eight on the stove which should put us right at about 32. And if it's a little bit more, that's okay. I check it, and if it's not at 32, I either cook it longer to get it at 32, or I put hot sap in there to dilute it because I have too much sugar in there, and I dilute it so it's at 32. So I have a consistent product at the right density, right amount of sugar. After it's done here, I put it in pails, and take it home. When I get it home, I'll heat it up, bring it to a boil again, or just, just to the point of boiling, at least 200 degrees. They recommend 180 degrees temperature. I bring it up to about 200 degrees and then put it in hot sterile jars and uh, put the lids on and set them on the table for them to cool. so we'll just have to see which blind they're in and take the other one. The Nature Conservancy provides this wonderful opportunity to the public. It's free and the blinds are out here on a booming ground. It's a reservation system. You got to get in there in the dark so it's an early morning activity. We were up by 4.30 and walking in by 5 o'clock this morning. Settled into our blind you know, before 5.30 when it was still dark. What I usually do is I just open the front window, 
Uh, we do have side windows and back windows, but unless they're usually out front, so we'll just, for more concealment, we'll keep those closed for now. And it's pretty cool, you sit there, you hear the birds start, you know, and they're kind of coming in. You can't see them, and you might see a little shadow going, but then they gather. And then as the light starts to come on, you see all the orange sacks, and they're just displaying and going to town making all their calls. And they're not doing it for us, they're doing it for female prairie chickens, but it's quite a show. We're standing right now on the Nature Conservancy's Blue Stem Prairie, which is about a 6,000 acre native prairie grassland just east of Fargo-Moorhead. We are on a prairie chicken booming ground, and a booming ground is a location that the males gather in the spring of the year to display and try to win the favor of female prairie chickens. There were prairie chickens throughout kind of the what I'd call the western southern part of Minnesota, but the numbers of prairie chickens really exploded when settlement first started. With the introduction of some agriculture, there were, you know, seeds, wheat seeds and bigger seeds than what the native prairie would provide. There was a time when the balance between cropland and grassland was just right and prairie chicken numbers just exploded. But then we continued to destroy grasslands and we got to the point now where we have in Minnesota less than 1% of our original grasslands left. So prairie chicken numbers really plummeted as a result of that. We still have a nice stable population of prairie chickens here in the state. My estimate is that we've probably got about 5,000 prairie chickens in Minnesota based on the survey work that we do. The primary prairie chicken range in Minnesota, we're right in the middle of it here, you know, on the Nature Conservancy's Blue Stem Prairie. But if you go roughly 60, 70 miles north of here up to the communities of Fertile, Minnesota, Crookston, Minnesota, Mentor, Minnesota, drop south to Twin Valley, Minnesota, then come through Felton. Now we're kind of in the Glendon Hawley area. And as you continue south through Barnesville down to Rosse, that's kind of the primary prairie chicken range in Minnesota where you can still find these birds gathering every spring on their booming grounds doing their mating ritual basically. Their display is quite comical, you know, they've got what are called pinnae, but they look like rabbit ears that they inflate on the top of their head. They drop their wings, they stomp their feet, but then they inflate these look like oranges on the side of their neck. These air sacs inflate full of air and they're bright orange with a crimson top. And they run around and fight each other and make a variety of different calls from a cackle call to a, the booming sound is kind of like when you blow on a pop bottle and you kind of get the call. And then they got hoops. The hoops they kind of reserve for when females come to the booming ground and then they, they hoop it up when the females come. The males want to be seen. They want the females to find them and see them. When they select a site for a booming ground, they don't go in the tall grass, which is where they would be safest from predators. They find an area that's really matted or mowed or even uh, some cultivated field next to good grassland is what they always select for a booming ground. I'm a pretty firm believer if it weren't for the real intensive conservation efforts by groups like the Nature Conservancy, Minnesota Prairie Chicken Society, Pheasants Forever, DNR, Fish and Wildlife Service, that have been going on really since the 70s. It really became evident that without a very concerted protection effort on grasslands, we were going to lose pretty much most of our grasslands, which meant we were going to lose our prairie chicken population. <laughs> The prairie chicken has multiple nicknames. One of them is kettle drummer. Imagine a cast iron old skillet frying pan hanging from your cabin. And if you kind of whack that, say with a stick or a hammer, you get that reverberation that kind of goes Well, that's kind of the booming sound. Uh, another uh, nickname is old Muldoon. And you know, it's kind of You know, that, that's the booming. And then I heard one, one recently, a very early settler was out early in the morning plowing and he thought the uh, prairie chickens were almost taunting him, kind of like, you old fool, you know, you old fool, you know. <laughs> 
for plowing the prairie. So I thought that was a pretty good one too. Different ways to describe the booming sound. If you were sort of an early settler moving through this area and you just sort of set up camp and in the morning in the pitch dark, all of a sudden you hear this woo 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 you started to hear that, you'd really wonder, well, what's that? You know, <laughs> it'd be spooky. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Join us again on Common Ground. If you have an idea for Common Ground in North Central Minnesota, email us at legacy at lptv.org or call 218-333-3014. To watch Common Ground online, visit lptv.org and click Local Shows. Episodes or segments of Common Ground, call 218-333-3020. Production funding of Common Ground was made possible in part by First National Bank Bemidji, continuing their second century of service to the community, member FDIC. Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, with money by the vote of the people November 4th, 2008. If you watch Common Ground online, consider becoming a member or making a donation at lptv.org.